Ivan Maher and Squeeze Maher till you see gets all fucking weight pagla jo tha. One more. Mera da kar raha tha kuch nahi. Uh, hello, hello to everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, sorry about that delay. I had a problem with my uh, connection, so it was uh, yeah, it was giving me problem. But um, finally, I'm here, so I'm connected, and I just wanna cover. Actually, I wanted to do a recap first of the whole process of understanding inflation, uh, and how it ties into. The aggregate demand, aggregate supply, as well as understanding the kind of environment that we are currently in, where we have high inflation. It is partially disinflationary, but inflation is still high based on central bank standards, and also the fact that interest rates are also high. But to some economies, uh, the effects of higher interest rates are visible, but not to the extent at which we'd want to see, right? For example, like we had on Friday, we had very strong uh, jobs data coming out from the US. If you look at all some, some of the economic indicators as well, like your consumer confidence, ISM, looking at some lagging indicators like GDP, uh, they are also signaling a very resilient economy. So in as much as we had a step down in terms of the interest rate hikes, from the Fed to a 0.25%. But looking forward or moving forward, I do anticipate interest rates to remain higher for longer based on the environment that we are currently in and based on the expectations moving forward. One of those expectations being obviously China reopening. If, China, if there's China reopening, then that means what? That means global demand is going to increase. And if global demand is going to increase, then that will result in an increase of what? Of energy uh, or a demand of an increase in the demand of energy. If that happens, that is also going to feed into inflation. So if that happens, then we'd have, uh, how, how can I call it? Maybe like a rebound sort of of inflation when we do have a full China reopening. And at the same time, from the Fed perspective, we have very, very strong labor market. And if the labor market is still strong, then definitely inflation is not going away. So that is where we are currently stuck at, which is why I feel that interest rates are still going to go higher. They might not be as aggressive, but I feel that the fight against inflation is not yet done. Yes, it has receded in a couple of months, but we are not yet done when it comes to inflation. So I just wanted to go over that. Uh, but firstly, just starting off, uh, just want to give a quick recap on understanding inflation and interest rates and how everything ties together. Uh, so is everyone, can, you, can everyone hear my audio? If you can, just give me a thumbs up. Okay, so I'll quickly just share my screen. Uh, just give me a moment. And some of you might be familiar with this. You might have an understanding of it. But it's very important uh, when it comes to understanding where the central banks are, what they are looking at, what they are focusing on to give us a sense of direction as we move forward.
Uh, okay. So uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this framework in terms of understanding inflation and how having an understanding of inflation, you actually get to see the importance uh, of, read, of what really drives the market. So what really drives uh, investors, right? So we're looking at growth, we're looking at inflation dynamics. So whenever we're focusing on growth, focusing on inflation, that gives us an idea or a picture of what to expect as we move ahead, right? So essentially starting off with inflation, we know that there is a target that every central bank is, main, is mandated to try as much as possible to keep inflation as close as possible to that target, right? So for most developed economies, it's uh, 2%. Here in South Africa, that's, that's around 3 to 6%. So essentially, that is like the, I don't want to say the benchmark, but that is like the target that every central bank has. And they now need to try and keep inflation as close as possible to the target. So whenever inflation gets above the target, let's say 2% target in this example, whenever inflation gets above the target, then the central bank will need to step in, either in the form of um, interest rates, because central banks uh, have tools at their disposal. So in the form of interest rates or increasing money supply, or sorry, decreasing money supply, which in case they would have to increase interest rates. If inflation is above the what? The 2% target or the, or, the, or, 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 or the inflation target that that specific central bank has. And in a situation or a scenario where inflation is below the target and they're trying to stimulate the economy by pushing inflation higher towards the target, then they'd have to apply measures of either cutting interest rates or increasing money supply. Because if they increase money supply, it results in what's in inflationary pressures. Uh, essentially, going back to basic uh, economics, if there's an increase in supply, then the price of that specific uh, security will depreciate. Right. So in this case, if they increase money supply, there's an increase of that specific currency so the value of that currency will depreciate and that is what inflation essentially is it depreciates the value of that specific currency right so that is in a nutshell how it all plays out but we do not have to forget as well that in addition to central banks there's also what fiscal policy so fiscal policy that is from the government right so also how they also position fiscal policy also plays a role in the two types of environment where inflation is high or where inflation is low, right? So when inflation is very high to they, they cause uh, for the government, there's two ways that they can really try and impact um, or they can try and control fiscal policy. So the first one is government spending. And then the second one, it is taxation, right? Or taxes. So in an inflation or in a high inflationary environment, they need to do what? They need to decrease government spending because if government spending is increased, then that will, like I said, that, will, that, that means an increase in money supply and that will also push into inflation. So if inflation is already high from a fiscal standpoint, not from a monetary policy or central bank standpoint, from a fiscal, which is governmental standpoint, then government spending needs to be cut lower. Because if government spending is cut lower, then in addition to cutting government spending, they need to increase taxes. Because if they increase taxes, that means that they are taxing consumers or the general public. And if they do that, that means that they are decreasing what the, the, the disposable income, or let me say the amount of money that is in the hands of consumers. And if there is a restriction or a limit on that, then consumers won't be spending haphazardly, which will in turn contribute to inflation. So that is just a simplified story of the whole inflation. If inflation is high or if inflation is low, how do central banks and how does the government try to act or position themselves in those two different environments? But to get a deeper understanding, we need to understand where inflation essentially comes from. And with this one as well, I'll just be brief. I'll just be, uh, I'll just cover the surface. So with inflation, 
essentially I'd view it as there is two types of inflation that we focus on the most. So the first one is cost push inflation. So essentially for cost push inflation, that is inflation due to uh, commodity prices, whether it's high, high oil prices or whether it is uh, high energy prices, high gas prices, all of that, you know, so or electricity prices are high. So that is what we call or we know as cost push inflation, because what that happens if the prices of oil go up or go higher, then companies who use oil, for example, uh, in, 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 in their day to day businesses, they will also face what higher expenses in terms of purchasing that oil or of, of acquiring that supply of oil. And then for them as well to try and maintain their profit margins, they will then have to increase their prices of whatever products that they are supplying. And that in turn, like I said, it feeds into what? It feeds into inflation. So that is how inflation comes about from a, sorry. So that is how inflation comes about from a, uh, from a cost push or commodity side inflation, right? So inflation that is produced by high commodity prices or energy prices. Then the second part, Oh, and then just on that note as well, with the commodity side of inflation or the cost push side, the central banks do not really have much of a control in that. So fiscal policy, uh, or sorry, not fiscal policy, but monetary policy from a central bank side does not really have much of an impact when it comes to the cost push side of inflation. Then the second uh, producer of inflation, which we most focus on as traders. Uh, we do, of course, focus on the commodity side because it plays, like I said, it plays a role in the whole inflation cycle. But when it comes to interest rates and everything, then that is the demand side inflation. By demand side inflation, it means that uh, there is an increased demand of goods and services. So let us just paint a picture here. So the economy is doing well, or the economy is growing, it is expanding. When the economy is expanding and growing, that means what? That means that there is uh, more job creation is happening. Companies are hiring. If companies are hiring, that means more, more consumers or the general public of that specific economy, they are getting jobs. If they're getting jobs, that means that they are getting wages. If they're getting wages, it means that they now have money or some form of disposable income that they can use to purchase goods and services. So if now they have money to purchase goods and services, that means that the demand of goods and services is going to go higher. If the demand of goods and services go higher, like, like uh, going back to basic economics, if demand is high, then the prices go up. But if supply is high, then the prices go down. So in this case, because now there's an increase in the demand of goods and services, because companies, because the economy is booming, companies are employing, and uh, most people are getting a salary or a wage. So now that, that increase in the demand of goods and services now feeds into the economy in the form that businesses will now see that there's an increased demand of their products. So if there's an increased demand of their products, then they will need to raise their prices so that they can capitalize on that. Like I, like I said, guys, I'm just being vague or trying to be as basic as I can be with this whole concept. So they will raise what? They will raise prices based on the increase in demand of goods and services. And if companies raise prices, that means that they what? the cost of living is now also going up because the, 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 the cost of a basket of food has also gone up because if more people can afford to buy food, then companies will also raise what? Will also raise their prices to try and meet the demand, right? So that is how the demand side of inflation is produced. So with that being said, in the, in, in the form, in, in, in trying to tame demand side inflation, of which I've just tried to paint a very simplified picture of it with, with, with consumers getting money and now the demand of goods and services going up. So that produces inflation and then inflation ends up surpassing the 2% target because the economy is growing, the economy is booming. And on the other side, we also have, uh, let's say we also have um, on the fiscal side of things, like I explained, the fiscal side is the government side. 
And remember, I said on the fiscal side, there's two, there's two components, government spending or taxes. So in a high inflationary environment or where in inflation is getting high, let's say from a low, moving from a low inflationary environment to a high inflationary environment, which we explained on the demand side of inflation is when consumers have an, in, or there's an increase in the demand of goods and services. The fiscal side, let's say government spending is increased. And if government spending is increased, that means there's also a what? an excess supply of cash. If there's an excess supply of cash, that also means what? That also means it's going to contribute to inflation. If it contributes to inflation, taxes are low. If taxes are low, that means that what? Those consumers who are now, who now have employment, who can now afford goods and services, resulting in an increase in the, good, in, in, the, in the demand of goods and services, if taxes are low, those very same employees or those very same consumers now have excess disposable income. What is excess disposable income? At the end of the month, they do have some bit of cash that they could spend elsewhere. And if that is the case from a fiscal standpoint, government spending is high, uh, taxation is low or taxes are low, then that will also contribute to inflation. So that is the scenario with high inflation or what produces high inflation from a what from a demand side inflation in terms of the demand of goods and services. So now in that specific scenario where inflation is high, now the government can step in with fiscal policy, like I said, and the central banks can also step in. Because remember, the central banks are mandated to keep inflation as close as much as possible to their target. In this case, we're using 2% as an example. So to make, to, to try and simplify everything, so the central bank is going to step in by trying to understand that, okay, what causes, in, what caused inflation in the first place? Okay, what really caused inflation was what? Was the increase in the demand of goods and services. So for us to try and tame inflation or slow down inflation, it's very simple. We just need to try and what? And tame or reduce the demand of goods and services so that is the that is the 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 like i said i'm just being tried i'm trying to be as basic as possible so that is the mindset we're having now from a central bank standpoint so now the central bank is going to say okay how do i slow down or decrease the demand of goods and services because where is this demand of goods and services coming from or this increase in demand of goods and services because the economy is growing employment is is high uh, a lot of a lot of uh, consumers are getting employed, so I need to reverse all of that, right? In as much as it's going to cause pain, but I need to reverse all of that to try and lower inflation, because I am mandated as a central bank to keep inflation as close as possible to my two percent target. So just try and stick with me, guys. Yeah, if you're feeling kind of lost, I'll give you a Q and A session at the end, but there's. I need to explain this so that when we get to the second part of this um, sort of lesson that I have for you, you'll be able to understand why. So going back to the central bank now trying to tame high inflation. So now they need to reverse engineer what really caused inflation in the first place. So we're only focusing on the demand side of inflation or inflation that is produced by the increased demand of goods and services. So now the central bank will decide, okay, based on my monetary policy tools that I have, I need to increase interest rates. So now you may be asking yourself, how, do, how does increasing interest rate result in a potential reduction in inflation? So it reverses everything because when interest rates go up, that means that loan repayments also go up. If loan repayments also go up, that means that it is squeezing the income of all those consumers who are now employed, who are now getting wages. If, they, if their income is being squeezed, that means that they can no longer spend money haphazardly, just to put it blatantly, you know? So, now they need to redirect their money in proper spending or maybe to pay back those loans. And then in that case, the demand of goods and services will eventually decrease or cool down because now they do not have that excess cash because the hiking of interest rates is squeezing what? It's squeezing their salaries, right? Or their wages that they're earning from their jobs. So now 
that is how they are going to try and reverse engineer what really caused inflation in the first place when it comes to demand. So now, how does that also affect, how does the interest rate hikes from the central banks also affect businesses, right? Because remember, it's businesses who are hiring these consumers, and now these consumers have money to spend, resulting in an increase in inflation or demand of goods and services. So now, this increase in interest rates is going to affect businesses in a sense that if businesses have loans, and they now also need to focus in on paying their loans because interest or interest or loan repayments are going higher. Now there is what there is limited capital to do what to grow and expand as a business, right? So if there's limited capital to grow and expand as a business, that means that that will also impact what employment, which might also result in a high unemployment because if let's say interest rates keep going higher and now businesses are struggling to stay afloat because they now need to focus more on paying back uh, whatever they owe to the banks because interest rates are going higher. The first people to take a hit whenever such a scenario is presented, it is the who? It is the employees. That is when you have layoffs, you have retrenchments, or you have people going uh, going into unemployment or where unemployment starts to increase because what because the businesses they also trying or the, the yeah the businesses are also trying to stay afloat so if that happens where now businesses get to a point where they struggling to pay back their loans because interest rates are going higher now they starting to retrench or lay off some employees then that means that more people will be unemployed unfortunately if that's an unfortunate case, but if more people are being unemployed, that means that what? The demand of goods and services will also go down. If the demand of goods and services will go down because less people now have money to spend or money to even afford goods and services, that will what? That will result in, that will hopefully result in a reset of the economy in terms of inflation because now inflation will eventually subside on its own because there is now there is no fuel to the fire the fuel being an increase in the demand of goods and services so that is in a nutshell the reason behind central banks hiking interest rates whenever they are trying to fight high inflation so that also gives you an idea or an understanding that whenever interest rates are going higher in as much as it hurts us as the consumers, but it is to a certain degree for a good cause. And then from a trading or an investor standpoint, we look to buy into that economy because of course, higher interest rates are very favorable or they are very attractive. So that is in a nutshell, when interest rates are higher from a monetary policy or central bank standpoint. And from a fiscal policy, which is the government side, to try and tame high inflation, of course, it will. the government will need to reduce government spending. So squeeze the money or the amount of money that the government has access to by decreasing government spending and also increase taxation. Because if they increase taxes, they also squeezing more of, of, the, of the consumer's uh, salaries uh, and then that means that consumers are getting paid or they having less uh, of, of a disposable income and that will eventually result in a decrease in demand right or it will lower aggregate demand so that is in a nutshell what happens whenever inflation is high and how the central bank and also how the government tries to lower or cool down high inflation so before i continue anyone who is lost just you can you can type in the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh and let me know okay so if everyone if there's no one who's uh, coming out and saying they lost so which means everyone is tracking you all following so far just just give just just type in why in the chat okay okay i'll i'll assume that everyone is following because <laughs> nobody yeah, said yeah. uh yeah i'm i'm following yeah i'm following okay sorry yeah. hello yes 
Um, I have a question. Okay. Um, were you were you just in? Uh, sorry, I came in late. Were you just introducing the the? Were you just talking about inflation, or you have touched on other? These are the GDP and interest rates. Topics? No, no. I was just introducing inflation from understanding where it comes from and how then the, the central bank or the government tries to either tame inflation if it's high. In this case, I was just explaining if inflation is high and how the government tries to step in in terms okay, of the so, government and the central bank, yeah. Okay, um, I have just one question regarding that. You said monetary policy is when, mm -hmm. is when, the, is when the, the, the government is stepping in to control inflation, right? No, monetary policy is when the central bank Sorry, the central bank says. Yeah. Oh, okay, and then fiscal policy is when the is when the government is stepping in. Yes. Okay. No. No, it's okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So I'll continue. Um, so <clears throat> now we have an understanding of what causes the demand side of inflation, and how the central bank as well as the government try to tame inflation when it's high, right? And then on the other hand, or on the other side of the spectrum, when inflation is low, or maybe let's say we are in a deflationary phase, or we're experiencing deflation, because when inflation is high, inflation or hyperinflation, deflation when inflation is very low, let's say maybe below zero in the negative territory, right? So there, and also not trying to get or dive in very deep into the economics, but like I said, I'll just be as superficial and as basic as possible. So in this case, now you'd say, but if high inflation is not good, because it means that the cost of living is going higher and the cost of a basket of food or yeah, a basket of food means that it's not good because it's uh, hurting the consumers, then why would then low inflation also not be good? High inflation is not good. Low inflation is also not good. Why? So from a low inflation spectrum or from a deflationary spectrum, it's, it's, it is the fact that we need to remember that we said inflation devalues a currency, right? So if there is low inflation, if there's high inflation, the value of the currency is what? Or oh, the, the, the currency loses value. But if inflation is now low, that means that the currency to a certain extent is not losing value. So that currency is actually strong. The currency is not weak, it is strong. So in a deflationary environment, the currency is strong. So you'd say a, a strong currency isn't that good. Yeah, it has its, it, it has its perks, but it's also not good from a standpoint if we view the economy as a business. So let's view the economy as a business in, in the sense that economies or most economies, they do, exports and imports right that is how they do business exports and imports so now if you are an economy and you are and you have deflation or you're experiencing or you have a very strong currency then it can to a certain extent hurt business because people if people now have to buy from you like i said i'm just using a very simplified version if people have to buy from you or other economies have to get goods and services from you that they can get from somewhere else but your currency is stronger. So that means that it's more expensive if they get goods from you compared to someone else, then highly likely that they'll get goods from the next person or the next economy rather than coming to you. So that is why low inflation is not that much acceptable, right? I don't want to say it's not good, but it's not acceptable from a central bank standpoint once again, which is why their target is not zero or negative, but they, most central banks have a positive inflationary target because that means that that central bank is comfortable with inflation or is that central bank is comfortable with their currency losing value of 2% at least per day. It is very comfortable with their, with, with that specific central bank is comfortable, sorry, with their currency losing value of 2% at least per day. That is how it happens, right? Uh, 
So guys, give me, just give me a, a moment, just give me a couple of minutes. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so where was I? Okay, I was explaining the reason behind uh, low inflation not being accepted or by the central banks and the central banks having a positive target, which means that they are okay with their currency losing value, let's say at a rate of 2%, because that keeps them competitive in the realm of doing business. That is as basic as I can possibly explain it. The reason why 0% inflation is not good because we'd say, but that is what we'd want so that we can be happy as consumers and we don't have to pay so much for, or the cost of living wouldn't have to be as high. But then in the longer run, it also affects the actual economy in terms of doing business, right? <clears throat> so that is on the other side of the spectrum of inflation when inflation is low. We've explained when inflation is high, now we're in a case where inflation is low. So going back to where we started, when inflation was high, it is understanding what produces inflation. We said we have commodity prices. So if commodity prices is high, are high, then that results in high inflation, right? And then we have in a, in a sense where, <clears throat> sorry, when inflation is low and we have a demand side of inflation where we said if there's an increase in the in the demand of goods and services that uh, flows through into inflation and that results in high inflation, right? So on the other side of the spectrum, whenever there is low inflation, that means that the demand of goods and services isn't so high because if the demand of goods and services is high or there might be a demand of goods and services, but the economy is not in a good position, it's not growing in a sense that it could accommodates that demand of or, or that high demand of goods and services. So essentially, when inflation is low, the central bank, the central bank needs to understand what really produces inflation, right? Not necessarily they need to understand, but we need to go back to that sense, right? Okay, to produce inflation, we need the economy to be growing, businesses need to be hiring, and also people need or consumers need to be getting a wage or a salary so that they can spend. And that will, will result in what? In the increase of goods and services. So on the where inflation is low, the goal there, let us, let us put it in that way. The goal there is to try and push uh, or increase the demand of goods and services so that inflation can be pushed higher and closer towards the 2% target. On the other side of the spectrum, when inflation is high, the goal or objective there is to try and lower the demand of goods and services. So if we understand that in when inflation is low, the objective is to try and increase the demand of goods and services, then that means that the central bank need to do what? They need to cut interest rates because they had to increase interest rates so they can lower the demand of goods and services. So in order to stimulate the demand of goods and services or essentially just stimulate the economy, they need to lower their interest rates because if they lower interest rates, that means what? Loan repayments aren't so high. Borrowing money is now cheap. If borrowing money is cheap, that means that consumers who qualify can borrow money. Businesses can borrow money. If consumers borrow money or businesses borrow money, they now have, I don't want to say excess cash, but let's say excess capital to spend it somewhere. So for businesses, they might spend that, that, that excess cash that they've borrowed because borrowing money is cheap. They will spend it by what? By, let's say, opening more branches. So they would maybe franchise or they would uh, open a new branch. If they open a new branch, they need employees there. So if they need employees, that means that unemployment is what is going lower. More consumers are getting employed. If more consumers are getting employed, it goes back to the whole cycle. That means that more consumers are getting a salary and now more consumers can afford to, uh, to buy some goods and services or to purchase some goods and services. And that will eventually feed into the increase in the demand of goods and services. So that is the whole objective by ensuring that the cost of borrowing or interest rates are low when inflation is low so that we can try and prop up inflation towards the 2% target because we have that basic, most basic understanding that 
a very low inflation uh, is not that it means that currency is strong, but it's not entirely a good thing if that, that currency is strong or overvalued, right? Like I just explained earlier. So that is the reason behind that, behind central banks looking to cut interest rates whenever inflation is low to try and stimulate the economy. So that is the first what? That is the first approach from a central bank standpoint or from a monetary policy standpoint. And then the second one is of course, quantitative easing or stimulus where essentially the central bank is injecting money into the economy. So that is from a monetary policy standpoint when inflation is low. And then remember, we have monetary policy, which is central banks. And then we also have fiscal policy, which is the government. So from a fiscal policy standpoint, to try and stimulate the economy, for example, let's say if it were in a, in a recessionary environment, the, from a fiscal policy standpoint, government spending would have to be increased because if government spending is increased, then increase in what? Increase in the in, 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 in government spending so that creates more opportunities, job opportunities, and they have more projects that the government can fund, right? If that happens, then it will, and then they also, what, they also uh, decrease the taxes. That means that those employees who now have a salary, they now getting taxed less. If they're getting taxed less, they now have excess or disposable income that they could spend somewhere, which means they will spend it most probably on buying or purchasing goods and services, and then it will feed into inflation. So that is essentially how this whole inflation wheel sort of in the most basic sense feeds into one another, into one another. So always understand it from where is inflation coming from and then how, do, how does the government or the central bank play a role from a monetary policy standpoint from a central bank or from a fiscal policy from the government. So those are the two uh, tools that, that, that are that at the disposal uh, of the government or the central bank to, to try and handle or to try and, uh, and, and, and operate in the two different types of environments when it comes to inflation, high inflationary environment or low inflationary environment. So those are the two, um, yeah, oh, those are the two methods from the government and the central bank. So going back to questions again, I've just explained that part. Anyone who has any questions based on that? Okay, which means we all good. Everyone understands this. So oh, that's good. That's good which means you probably understood this before I even explained it. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I'm just reinforcing the whole idea. So yeah, that's good. So which means everyone is following. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can, I just, can I just summarize the last point that you, that you, that, that you just spoke? Mm -hmm. um, in summary, you say that um, Regarding the fiscal policy, which is when the government is stepping in to regulate uh, inflation, right? You said when inflation is high, the government will reduce government spending, right? Yes, yes. And increase taxes, meaning consumers, uh, consumers' disposable income will be less, meaning yes. the, the demand of goods will be less. Yeah, because they won't have that much of money to spend. Right. And then on the other spectrum, that you, you say that when inflation is uh, low, uh, the government in the fiscal, uh, with the fiscal policy will increase government spending and decrease tax, taxes. Yes. And meaning that consumers' disposable income will increase, yes. meaning that the demand of goods will increase. Yeah, because they now have that excess money or cash to spend. Right. And then for the monetary policy, when inflation is high, central banks will hike interest rates, which will mm -hmm. affect businesses, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then that also limits employment on the side of businesses, meaning unemployment yes. will now increase. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And also the part of loans where you're saying that 
um, businesses, will, businesses will be struggling to pay loans because of the high interest rates. Yeah. And then on the other side of the spectrum, he said when inflation is low, um, central banks will lower interest rates, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, okay, I know, I understand, I understand. Okay, yeah. So like I said, that I'm just trying to be as basic as I can possibly be. There's there's more to it, of course, if you go deeper into the economic, the economic side of things, like economics. But I'm just trying to be as simple as possible because this is not an economics class. I'm just this is for trading purposes. So it's just having an idea and trying to simplify the understanding of the whole process. So with that being said, I will now continue uh to essentially okay so to essentially understanding that uh if if growth oh, okay now and with with this whole understanding of inflation so that means that if growth or if the economy is growing then it would it would what contribute to inflation and if the economy is not growing then it would it would not contribute to inflation because whenever the economy is booming that is when we have what an increase in the demand of goods and services uh, compared to when the economy is not growing and the central bank needs to step in or the government will step in to try and stimulate the economy. So going back to what I said, when it comes to quantitative easing, where the central bank will inject money into the economy by buying bonds, uh, we also need to have a basic understanding of how they do that. Right, it's because we, we we hear the, the the term being thrown around quantitative easing, quantitative tightening. What does it mean in its simplest form? So to try and explain this, I'll just switch uh, to a different uh, picture that I have here of a simple. Uh, how can I say? It? Is it a balance sheet <laughs> of a bank or of a commercial bank? So. Um, just let me know if you if if you can actually see what actually looks like a balance sheet where it has bank assets uh, as well as uh, bank liabilities. So can everyone see that? Uh, you can see. Yeah, yeah, just type, can. Okay, so we can just type in one in the chat. So I assume everyone can see it. So this is a same, This is like I said most basic thing so this is how let's say my bank is structured up right so i have depositors who actually deposit money so i open up a bank and i have cash reserves of a hundred thousand dollars in this in this example and i actually get depositors uh, who actually deposit a sum total of nine hundred thousand dollars so that means that I have around a million, right, of cash. My cash reserves as well as the deposit, right? And then now I understand that since this is deposit, it's money that belongs to the depositors who have deposited money into my bank, this is now a liability to me as a bank because at the end of the day, I have promised all these depositors a certain interest for them to save their money with me I have promised them a specific interest. So which means that I owe them an interest, right? So I understand that, okay, this is actually an expense or a liability to me. So how do I use this to make money so that I can be able to pay these depositors, but to also make money for myself? So as a bank, I decided, okay, I'll take all of this money and I'll spread it out by investing in bonds. So I'll buy bonds, whether it be treasury bonds, mortgage bonds, whatever, I'll buy bonds. And then some of that money are also uh, issue it out in the form of loans. So I take all the depositors money. I do not take my cash reserve, the $100,000 that I have, but I all take the depositors money and that is the money that I use, right? So, which means in essence, cash, accessible cash that I have at the moment is a what? is only $100,000. So just to simplify things or for the simplicity of things, then what happens is we get into a financial crisis or yeah, there's financial turmoil 
And then all this, all these depositors come knocking at my door and they like, Sanele, uh, situation is bad outside. So we need our money back, right? We need to survive. We need to stay afloat, whatever the case may be. Whether those, those depositors are businesses or just ordinary everyday consumers, but they all need, not all, but most of them, let's say, need their money. But I only have $100,000. And if I were to actually just spend all this, then I wouldn't have any money at all left. Because with the bonds, I only have maybe certificates uh, in the form of, 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 of um, that I actually received when I bought those bonds, right? And then for the loans part, if the situation is bad outside and most depositors are coming to me to request their money, then chances are all the people that I've given a loan to most probably they won't be able to pay me back on time as well. So I'm now sitting at a deficit as a bank. So in that instance, when there is a financial turmoil, then what I do is I decide, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell all these bonds that I have. So 400,000 worth of bonds, I'm going to sell them in the, or I'll take them into the open market and try and sell them so that so that I can at least get a buyer. If I get a buyer, then I'll be able to uh, pay the depositors, right? And then in a normal situation where there is no financial turmoil or financial crisis, then that is simpler, yeah, let's say easier to do. But then now the situation is, I am not the only bank who is facing this. We're in a financial crisis, so all the other banks are most probably in a similar position. Depositors are knocking and they want their money. So now we are all trying to sell our assets or bonds that we have or that we are holding in the open market. So what does that create? That now creates an excess or an increase in the supply of bonds in the open markets. And remember basic economics, if the supply goes up, then the prices go down. So now these bonds that are worth 400K, because there's more banks or more, or, or there's an in excess uh, in terms of supply of bonds being issued or being sold in the open market, then the buyers can actually negotiate a cheaper price because if supply goes up, then prices go down. So these bonds that are worth 400K, I might even end up selling them for, let's say maybe, for example, say $300,000. So already I'm, I'm still at a deficit, right? Because everyone is trying to sell their bonds and the, and the buyers now have options to choose, okay, no, I only purchased uh, the cheapest bonds, right? Or at a cheaper price. Because if you, don't, if you don't take my offer, then I'll go to the next guy because there's an, everyone is trying to sell their bonds. So that is where bargaining power uh, is lost from, from my standpoint as a bank. So... What happens in that situation is that we have then a central bank step in. So a central bank can look at the central bank as the buyer of last resort because they, if, if I collapse as a bank, then that is definitely going to hurt the whole financial system. So now the central bank will step in as a buyer of last resort and be like, okay, no, I'll buy your bonds. I'll buy them for whatever they're worth. And in addition to that, I'll also loan you more money on top of that so that you can meet your obligations. Of course, then I, then let's say, yeah, they buy my bonds and whatever I'm selling them for. And they also give me a loan or cash, excess cash in addition to that. So in a sense, that is what quantitative easing is. Quantitative easing is when the central banks buy bonds. So they're buying bonds and they also what? They're also giving me excess cash. So in that sense, that is how the central banks are injecting money into the economy. They're buying bonds from me or from in the open market in a times of financial distress as a buyer of last resort, as a buyer of last resort. And in that case, they are injecting more money into the hands of banks, commercial banks, of which I am also one based on this example. And if now I have cash in my hands, that means my cash reserves have now been increased. I can now pay back the depositors because, of course, the central bank bought my bonds. And in addition, the money that or the excess money that the central bank gave to me, I understand the same way I did with depositors. 
if if I have money that does not belong to me as a bank, I know that that is a liability. So what will I do as a bank? Then I'll start using that money. Once the economy starts picking up, I'll start loaning out that money and everything. And what am I trying? What How will that affect the whole economic cycle? So we on the lower inflation side of the spectrum or when uh, there is a financial crisis. So if bonds are perform or the central banks are performing quantitative easing by buying bonds, that means that they are trying to stimulate the economy, which will hopefully stimulate demand. So if I, as a bank now have excess cash, I can, what, I can also contribute in stimulating the economy by giving more or putting more money in the hands of businesses all consumers and businesses will be able to grow and expand, hire more people, increase in, em in, in employment, means more people now have a salary, more people can, can afford goods and services, and then we stimulate the economy and we stimulate what? Inflation at the same time. And then hopefully inflation will slowly track towards our 2% target. So that is where the story of quantitative easing comes from. So I'm explaining this just to give you a simple explanation idea of where it comes from because it's one thing to just throw around the term but you need to understand why it is performed and to its basic sense how it is performed so that is what happens whenever a central bank is undergoing quantitative easing or they're running a quantitative easing program similar to what we had during uh, COVID in 2020 when we had a market crash and then we saw a what a huge injection of cash into the hands uh, of uh, commercial businesses. And then that resulted in what? In an increase uh, in, in central bank balance sheets because central bank balance sheets are mostly comprised of bonds because that is what central banks do. They buy bonds. Uh, so that is where the whole situation of quantitative easing happening during 2020 when, whenever they, when the economy was still recovering. So that helps in what? In stimulate in trying to stimulate the economy and eventually obviously stimulate what demand right and then that will, will that will feed through into inflation so whenever now we are in an inflate in an environment where inflation is high because in a low inflationary environment quant the, the central bank uh, performs quantitative easing which is buying bonds in a high inflationary environment where now the central bank is no longer trying to stimulate the economy or stimulate demand, but they are trying to slow down or reduce the demand, they need to do the opposite. Instead of buying bonds, they need to sell bonds. And that is where quantitative tightening now comes into the picture. So whenever, which is why now mostly we are hearing of quantitative tightening rather than quantitative easing. So with this, with just having this picture in mind of a most basic framework of how a bank operates, it will give you an understanding of why now we have quantitative easing or why now we have quantitative tightening, right? So I just also wanted to clarify on that point. So any questions? I feel like I've been blabbering for quite a long time. Any questions based on what I've just explained now? Is everyone tracking? Is everyone good? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll proceed from there. So essentially, I just wanted to go back to this and uh, start from the bottom, from the basics of everything, just as a refresher before we actually go into uh, what is, should I say, happening currently. Right, because yeah, I feel that if we understand the basics, then we'll be we'll better understand how to position ourselves uh, based on the current market market dynamics or the current inflationary environments that we have or that we are facing. Because we now understand that okay, if we now go back to the central banks and we read a central bank uh, monetary policy statement and we understand what the central banks are saying, what they are looking for, what their objectives are, then we could understand, okay, this is how it ties back into the whole environment that we are in, whether it's a high inflationary environment or low inflationary environment. And this is what we also need to pay attention to, right? So like I explained earlier as I was 
before I started this whole uh, sort of presentation that based on what is currently happening right now, central banks have been hiking interest rates so that just with that alone, we understand, okay, that means inflation is high, of which obviously it is. So what are the effects that we should be seeing to a certain extent? Because central banks have been hiking since last year. Most central banks, they started last year in tw around March 2021, 2022, sorry. So we should be seeing a, a decrease in demand. And to a certain extent, we should be seeing unemployment or less job creation, right? So jobs shouldn't be created, being created at a significant pace. If, even if they are maybe still being created, but it shouldn't be something that surprises the market, right? So that is what we should be anticipating to see, number one. Number two, we should also be seeing growth being impacted because we understand that if growth is being stimulated, then it will also stimulate demand. But if growth is suppressed, then it will also eventually suppress demand. But if growth is also surprising to the upside or the mark, the economy is showing some form of resilience, then that could also what tell us that, okay, probably the fight against inflation is still far from being over. And like I just said, that is essentially the story that I have, or that is my position at the current moment based on what is happening. Yes, most central banks have scaled back in terms of how much they are hiking interest rates, but we haven't really seen that much effects of, uh, of, um, of, of interest rate hikes to a point where we can say, okay, now we can expect the central banks to start cutting interest rates. Going back to China, China, COVID zero policy, they've dropped that. And now they're in a phase of reopening the economy. If they reopen the economy, that will result in a increase in what? In, in the global demand of energy, global demand of commodities, right? Because all this time, last year particularly, China has been in and out of lockdowns. And that, of, of course, affects what? Aff affects the demand side. So now that the economy is reopening, that will mean increase in demand. If there's an increase in demand, that is definitely going to feed into inflation, like I just explained, which is the reason why I was trying to explain the whole link, where inflation actually comes from. So from a commodity standpoint, increase in the demand of oil. If there's an increase in the demand of oil because China's economy is reopening, then that will mean that we're going to get a feed through from cost push inflation or commodity side inflation. So that means that now the fight against inflation is still far from over. And on the Fed side, we are seeing a very resilient uh, jobs market, which means employment is still there. Wages, uh, they slightly tick lower in terms of average hourly earnings. But from a, a, a jobless claim standpoint as well, that is also decreasing instead of increasing. So all of that are signaling that in as much as the interest rate hikes are having an effect on the economy because all the other factors are slowing down, but we're still seeing consumer confidence pushing higher. We're still seeing a strong, uh, uh, strong labor market. GDP, of course, it's a lagging indicator, but it's also in a positive territory, right? From, from a negative territory in the first two quarters of 2022, from that is with regards to the United States, right? Uh, economy or the US economy. So all of those things still support the fact that we might potentially see a rebound in inflation, especially if full China reopening. And do not forget, we also still have the war between Russia and Ukraine that is ongoing. Yeah, it might be in the backseat for now, and the market is not really paying much attention to it, but it is still there. It's still happening. And if, that, if Russia can pull their strings again, then that could also result in what in an additional uh, or in a contribution of, of inflation resulting in uh, commodity or cost push inflation increasing and also supply uh, chain disruptions as well, right? So all of those things still support a high inflationary environment. So with that being said, my standpoint is we are still going to see higher interest rate for longer. Um, if we do get interest rate cuts, most probably by the end of this year, or towards the end of this year, but based on how things are shaping up as we start the year, like I said, risks to upside, uh, re, uh, upside risks uh, or inflation risks, right? To the upside, China reopening, 
and then of course the the war between Russia and Ukraine and then of course um other geopolitical factors that might come into play during the course of the year and that could also shift the flow of capital back into the dollar as a safe haven currency right so i just also wanted to briefly touch on that and for me to actually be able to explain why i have that standpoint i felt i needed to explain uh or just give a refresher of this whole uh inflation and where the government fiscal as well as the monetary policy central bank actually come in to 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 try and uh fight um high inflation right and at the same time try and save the economy uh from a very hard landing or a hard recession so that is where i stand and um let me hear from everyone here should i continue i feel like i've gone i've gone i've been speaking for quite a a a a, a, a long duration of time uh so let me hear from everyone uh no let's 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 actually have a q a session first and then we can decide from the if, do i continue to the next segment that i had planned uh so yeah any questions based on everything that i've just uh spoken about or maybe any inputs might not does not have to be questions maybe something you felt i missed that you want to add just let me know. Okay, so nothing. Okay, that's a silence. Is that a good sign or a bad sign? Oh, it's okay. So some some are responding that they all could. Okay. So actually, uh, okay. Since there's not really much of a Q and A session, um, what I'm gonna do? Let's 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 make this sort of a series. Uh, so let's meet up tomorrow. Sorry? I have a question. Okay. I have a question, bro. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So the, based on what you explained and taught us from a, the A to Z, from GDP inflation on all other aspects. Yeah. Um, uh prince can you just repeat your question so how do you generate a trade idea i mean gross like the the, the everything that you have explained us like how yeah. do you generate a trade idea based on that based on this that... macro data this inflation interest rate inflation gdp all this global macro data yeah so do you now... just look at the Micro yeah. data divergence to uh, to generate a trade idea. Mm. Yeah, to a certain extent, that is that is what we want to see. We want to see that divergence, and in in addition to seeing that divergence, we also want to see. We also want to see. Um, okay, so with understanding inflation, understanding inflation, and 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 how it and how the whole. How, how, how to tame inflation or how to stimulate uh, inflation or the economy. This helps us when now we're reading a central bank, um, like I said, monetary policy statement. That is where all of what I've explained now contributes to us, to us uh, actually generating a trade idea. Because if, which is that, that is the second part of, 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 of or the second segment of this whole uh, lesson that I had, but I just feel that it's dragged on for, for longer than I had expected. So uh, my brain is a bit fogged up to get on, to get into it, which is why I was about to say, I think I should make it a series. Then tomorrow we meet again. And then I take it, I, I start the second segment at which I'll be looking at central banks now, focusing on the central banks, monetary policy statements. Because if we read that, 
we still understand the dual mandate, for example, like the Fed. The Fed simply has a dual mandate. They, they keep on saying it time and time again since 2022 to that. They want maximum employment and they want inflation towards the 2% target. Before, they also wanted maximum employment and inflation above, persistently above the 2% target. That was before what? That was before they started hiking interest rates, before they started tapering and all of that. Now, they're still saying the same thing, maximum employment, and then we also want to wanna see what inflation get towards the 2% target. And they do have maximum employment. What they currently don't have is inflation getting towards the 2% target. So now, in my mind, I can now look at that, read the whole statement, get what they're saying. They're also acknowledging that there is the, there are factors that are supporting a slowdown in the economy, but the job, the labor market is still robust. Okay. So now, in generating a trade idea, I won't obviously. I'm that is not the only individual thing that I'll look to, but it's one of the things that I can use because at the end of the day, central banks are the ones who are mandated to keep or to maintain price stability and steady growth of the economy. So if reading their statement and they say their primary objectives or goals is maximum employment, of which we do have maximum employment, which is why we're seeing a very strong, uh, robust market. And it's an ambiguous term to say maximum employment, but that la the labor market is strong. So for me, I regard that as maximum employment to a certain extent, right? So now what is the missing factor? Getting inflation close to 2%. So what will it require for inflation to get close to 2%? It will require what? The central bank to continue hiking interest rates, number one. Number two, it's going to require the central bank or the Fed in this, in this case to continue what? With their quantitative easing, sorry, quantitative tightening, of which if you read the whole statement, and like I said, I'll get into everything tomorrow. If you read the whole statement, they clearly say as well in one of the paragraphs that they will continue quantitative uh, or reducing the balance sheet or they will continue quantitative tightening as plan as previously explained, right? So which means that they're still continuing at the same pace and all of that. And what, if I, if I now, if we now look at what I've just explained, we said with quantitative tightening, they are, they are buying bonds. So, sorry, with quantitative easing. So with quantitative tightening, which means that they'll be what? They'll be selling bonds. So if they're continuing to sell bonds, that means that they're doing what? They are, they, are, they are tightening financial conditions. So in as much as they are reducing the pace of interest rate hikes, but we need to keep in mind that they still have not achieved a 2% a, a, a target, right, in terms of inflation. And that is what they want, as close as possible to 2% because the labor market is strong. Mm -hmm. So now if I look at that, I can see that, okay, there is a higher likelihood that we're going to see higher interest rates for longer. That it's just a portion of generating a trade idea for the Fed because unemployment is, sorry, empl unemployment is quite low, 3.4%. And we're also not very close to getting inflation down towards the target. So to get inflation down, more interest rate hikes and a continued uh, quantitative uh, tightening um, program of which they are doing. And I now understand that, okay, if they are performing quantitative uh, tightening, then that to a certain extent will also have an effect on what? On the stock market. If it have, has an effect on the stock market, that means that we'll probably see, we will, I won't be expecting that much of higher prices from the stock market or the indices, whether that be your S&P 500, so on and so forth. Because I understand that based on what I've read from their statement and based on what I'm seeing from the economy, because they're continuing, because if they really felt that, okay, now we've done a lot, then of course they will scale back like they are doing in terms of hikes, but they will also reduce in terms of the quantitative tightening process because they fearing or they fear overshooting what the inflation are, or over tightening, right? Of which that could throw the economy into a recession. But for them not doing that, how I view it is that they seeing that there's still more room uh, for, for, for higher interest rates or for interest rates to potentially even go higher. And then if we also have those other effects that I've just explained, global uh, China reopening, uh, war between Russia and Ukraine, if those also come into play, like I've just explained, then that will also contribute to inflation. That means 
in, interest rates will need to stay higher for longer. And of course, the labor market can definitely support that in the US economy. And if the labor market can support that, then it means that demand is not really dying as much as they, w- as they would want it to. Because if demand is if demand were to be dying or slowing down, then unemployment would also be going up. So that is where what I've just explained from A to Z to try and answer your question fits into the whole idea of generating a trade idea. And then of course we look at all the other economic drivers, your consumer confidence, uh, your PMIs, how, how is that also factoring in to what we are expecting? Because if we're expecting a pivot from the Fed, everything most things need to line up with that but so far there is slowdown but not to a sense that i could really say rate cuts are coming you know so but it's uh, but i'll get into I'll, I'll i'll go more in depth into that whole thing uh tomorrow and uh bro just one last question yeah. So now uh, i'm prince you know me like uh, we have been on call many times and i really appreciate you uh, did this call and gave us this knowledge and so so uh like i have seen your trading sheet how do you generate the trade idea uh all those macro data macro indicators but and then you go on a lot of things i can't say i don't want people to know you know so, uh, so based on that now the hedge fund just like the hedge fund now how the hedge fund does like the hedge fund my friend uh in, in china is working on yeah. a hedge fund so uh, he, sh- he says his name is Alan. He says he says that they have all the global macro data in their trading Excel sheet. The one you have, but this one Excel sheet is more advanced, bro. So they have the CPI, core CPI, PPI, core PPI, GDP, nominal GDP. So so they're gonna have the data of like 30, 50 years since it started, you know. So since the GDP yeah. number started on the website, they have it, and then they have the normal behavior. No, you know, I'm saying the normal behavior of the data. And then yeah. it, it is, is it about the uh, normal behavior? Also the current data, which comes up. And uh, so I have three columns in, uh, in the Excel sheet. The one, mm-hmm. uh, the one number of years, like 2001, 2010. So, and the data was that released on 2001, 2010. And then the average of the data that released in 2000, 2010. And then they have the average of it. And they have the standard deviation, all the other formulas, I think, I think which is useless for us. So the normal behavior is average, the max and mean, and the percent in change. So for example, for CPI, they have the normal behavior, the max uh, max data, the minimum data, and the average data. So, okay. So if the current value is above the average, so it's, it's growing, you know, and they compare it to normal, normal GDP with the same, you know. So, okay. do, you, do you say, do you getting what I'm saying? Uh, to a certain extent, I understand what you're saying. I mean, it's very high. Like, uh, like uh, I, I know you have the bank documents of uh, City Credit Suisse and, uh, you know, all those banks' documents we get. So yeah. you see all those uh, one-year forecasts, two-year forecasts they have on the currency pair. Yeah. So that forecast is generated by the global macro strategy on Excel sheet. They how it do it. It's completely different. Have seen yours. And it's very good for one to much, too much. Like it's very good, bro. Like hats off you that you have come with all of these things. But the institutions, they really do it in different way. In the core PPI and CPI, they have the percent in change. You know, yeah. They compare the percent in change in value on on the average overall overall average fifty years of percent, and then the current percent in change. So it's above the certain value. It's growing or below. It's fifteen. So they have a scorecard. So that's what I wanted to know from you. Do you know, can you explain me uh, how a scorecard works? Like tomorrow, if you have time, scorecard. So they will compare it to all the data and they'll compare it to scorecard and then they will uh, have the scorecard and they'll get the real macro trend of that, of that, uh, you know, current uh, currency, like like from GBP AOD. The current yeah. macro trend for GBP AOD and ZD are short, you know, in the institution aspect. Yeah. Like uh, I would, of- uh, for, from, from my simple understand, I can ex- try and explain it from my simple understanding of a scorecard, but mm-hmm. I wouldn't be able to under- to explain it from, cause we, like you said, we, you're using different models for me. I'm not an, I'm not an institution, obviously, 
So yeah. for me, I just try and keep it as simple as possible and as basic as possible. And then if there's something that I can learn and add to that, then I would. But for me, being short on GBP, for example, it's factors similar to what I've just explained. Definitely, All of those yeah. factors are playing a role, you know? So maybe the approach is definitely not as advanced as because those people have people who, who actually do deeper research and all of that yes. uh, but i i wouldn't really be able to explain scorecards to their levels because i, I don't use the same models that they use yeah like i, I will uh, email you the excel sheet which i have created based on my friend has given me an example and i'll send you just the scorecard is very complicated for it. So one side is inflationary, but good deflationary. But at the same time, it's very complicated. So uh, like, it, I don't think the scorecard matters that much if we get the data and if we understand the depth of the data. So you don't trade any economic rel releases, right? You only trade the second reaction and actual uh, theme or event. You're an event-based trader, am I right? No, I also trade economic news release. Not that much recently, but I do. Like sometimes if, the main religion is just like NFP, CPI, or yeah. You know, if it's a high, if it if it's a highly anticipated uh, news release, then definitely I'll definitely trade yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so you only trade the pricing in the what's market pricing in? No, not really that. Yeah. What then of what course what trade? what? <laughs> uh, I'll eventually get to it. We're doing a series, so I'll eventually get to how I approach a fundamental news release. All right, brother. All right. Just, yeah, it's know, all so it's for me. It starts all with the importance of it, like I said, uh, and 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 the grading of the actual news release. Because I won't be trading every news release. It's how important is it to market expectations mm -hmm. moving forward? How 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 important is it in affecting, uh, or, or in terms of the current environment that we are in? How important is it in terms of affecting the path of maybe interest rates, right? Of, of, of what the market anticipates based on interest rates, right? Based on yields and all of that. So if, if those news have that sort of significance, then I'm definitely going to trade them. But my decision of whether I'm buying or selling there is not really only just based on, uh, based on uh, the actual expectations. There's also technical, like simply technical chart components that I look to, uh, certain patterns that I look to in, in currencies that will, have, that will be affected by that specific uh, uh, news release, most importantly. And then I, I base a decision based, uh, and then I make a decision based on that. And it, it depends. I can end up before the actual news release or maybe after the actual news release, depending on that technical uh, setup that I, is it before? Or is it after? But yeah. Oh. Okay, 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 okay. But we'll eventually yeah. get to it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that's what I was asking. You know, the institutional one. They, yeah. uh, they, oh, they like they are completely focused on the data. You know, the, what are the data that are saying? Not on the CV that much. They do look yeah. at the CV, but the data. Data will tell them what the CVs are going to do. Even the uh, CVs are looking at the data. You know. I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, no, def definitely. We we all looking at the data because they also need to. If they say we are data dependent, that is because they're looking at the data. Yeah. So now it's about what is the data telling us? Is what the market is expecting what the data is telling us? Because now that's where the things might be different. But if market expectations are being confirmed about what the data is also telling us, then it's all good. But now if the there's, con there's a conflict there, then it's also uh, something to look into. Yeah, yeah, definitely, brother. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so like, I really, I have really, been following you from very long, bro. You're the best in the in terms of Forex fundamentals, man. Uh, no, like, no, no. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. The I've best. seen, not I have yet. seen people, bro, who like tend to be like fundamental trader, but but they, their ideas are not in physical form. So your ideas are made from the entire fundamental sheet. The one you have, the one you created. So it's, it's really good. <laughs> and you know, it has a support of your fundamental sheet and the data are really triple A. Your trades are very triple A based on the Instagram stories you used to put to. Your trades are completely triple A trades, you know, best, best. <laughs> nah, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>
definitely bro thank you uh, you yeah. you're doing the second series tomorrow right yeah 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 uh, same time the thing is the thing is i'll try and make it same time the thing is in south africa there's something called I'm not sure in other countries if you experience but load shedding so we have some power cuts maybe for like an hour so it affects my internet connectivity so it will actually let me just say around the same time as today but uh, i'll update uh, if if because i will get a schedule of how how things will be tomorrow uh, okay brother let us know on instagram we are yeah, very no. eager to join again no I'll definitely i'll definitely let so everyone know. uh is everyone good uh Tobago go Kevin no questions Kelvin sorry uh no question this side okay maybe one question about quantitative tightening uh, if yeah. you could explain that i understood quantitative easing so basically quantitative tightening is the opposite yeah essentially yeah because we need to understand that essentially it's referring to central banks and their balance sheets so quantitative tightening they they are reducing their balance sheets and i said earlier when i was explaining quantitative easing that they are the central bank's balance sheet is mostly composed of what of bond holdings right so holding bonds whether it's a treasury or mortgage whatever the case may be depending on the central banks whether it's a the european central bank or the bank of england or whatever so different securities for different central banks but in essence it's mostly comprised of bonds so whenever it's quantitative tightening it is the reduction of the central bank's balance sheet which means that for them to reduce their balance sheet what does the balance sheet compose of bonds so for them to reduce the balance sheets they need to sell their bonds right so they can either do or perform quantitative um tightening sorry by selling bonds so physically selling those bonds or they can wait for those bonds to mature and then not add to the balance sheet yeah, yeah. because you need to understand that when it comes to bonds bonds have a maturity date so if they buy maybe a specific bond it has a maturity date whether that be maybe 2 years whatever how many years right so if they have any bonds that are maturing within this let's say maybe within the next couple of months if they in a phase of quantitative tightening and they note they are not selling bonds outright which means physically selling those bonds then that means that whenever those bonds mature then they will cash out of course nope. and then they will not yeah. reinvest or buy yeah, they will purchase do. more bonds to add because quantitative tightening essentially means they are reducing the balance sheet and for them to reduce the balance sheet that means they do not have to add more bonds or purchase more bonds okay <clears throat> for quantitative tightening to be effective let me say it in that way okay yeah, i understand okay. okay so guys yeah we'll we'll we'll, we'll... We'll, we'll we'll pick up everything tomorrow so tomorrow will just be i won't be i won't start with this whole uh, process so for tomorrow I'll just uh go straight into the central banks look at the different central banks understanding the decisions they make and why and then like the bank of japan the bank of japan is one is an interesting one of course so we'll definitely be looking into that to look into the euro and then looking at if whether the data also supports uh what we're getting from the central banks is it supporting the forward guidance from the central banks ecb they've planned that they're going to be hiking by 50 basis points or 0.5% in march as well so what will happen after that is the data also supporting that very same narrative you know so that is those are all the things we'll be looking into uh tomorrow so yeah i guess i'll have to end it there so cheers and thank you to everyone for tuning in uh for your time and um yeah i hope you got something from it and it's been uh worth your time mm. so, uh, cheers so guys so
Thanks, Prabhu. Cheers.